From my school days onwards, I've been interested in the question of how modern thinking emerged and modern observation. I wrote an essay on the Renaissance and what caused it when I was in my sixth form at school. And later at university, we looked at the scientific revolution and tried to guess what might have been behind it. But I never found any really satisfactory solution to either the question of the Renaissance, the old ideas that it was something to do with the rediscovery of knowledge, well, that doesn't explain much, or the growth of urban centres in Italy, that didn't seem to explain much, and there was nothing else much in the way of explanation going. But the wider and perhaps even more important question of how modern scientific thought, open thought, questioning the scientific method, the Baconian revolution, how that, all that emerged. Whenever I looked at books, they never seemed to be satisfactorily explaining that. And it came up particularly in relation to the West and the East. Most people agreed that a scientific revolution or growth in reliable knowledge, testable, provable, practical knowledge, was a Western phenomenon. There had, of course, been much reliable knowledge in Greece and Rome and Islamic civilizations, but the scientific revolution with a capital S and R was thought to be something that occurred in the West from perhaps as early as the 13th, 14th century with Occam and Roger Bacon, Gross Test, Italians and others through the famous 16th, 17th, 18th century revolution. But what had caused this, and particularly I was intrigued by what was and is known as the Needham question. Joseph Needham wrote a great book on science and civilization in China where he showed, as most people knew, that if you'd looked at the world in, say, 1200, the places where science, in our sense, reliable knowledge was most developed, were in China, with the great discoveries, clocks, compasses, gunpowder, printing, and so on. And in Islam, a fantastic development of chemistry and other sciences in from the 8th century, 9th century in Islamic civilizations. So if you'd put your money on where science was going to develop, it would have been in Islamic or Chinese or perhaps even Indian civilizations. But it didn't. So why, two questions, why didn't it develop further in Islam and China? And why did it develop and lead to much of what underpins our modern world? growth of science and technology in the West. Needham struggled with this problem all his life and in the great grand uh, titration and other summary books he's still struggling with it. He never solved it. He in the end roughly thought it must have been something about the social economic organization of the West, capitalism, individualism and so on. But he couldn't pin it down. Um, but in trying to deal and find a solution to this problem, I was attracted to another idea of detectives, Sherlock Holmes and Dupin, and that's the idea of absences and silences. Things that aren't there are as important as things that are there. Now, there are various passages on this in both uh, Edgar Allan Poe and Conan Doyle's work. But the most famous, which is more or less part of popular folklore and is known by many people, is in the story of the Silver Blaze, in which Sherlock Holmes is asked to investigate the murder of a very expensive racehorse. And in this, Holmes famously refers to 
The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Night Time. And when someone quizzes him, Watson, why was it curious, uh, and notes that the dog did nothing in the night time, Holmes replied, that was the curious incident. Later he elaborates on this. Before deciding that question, I had grasped the significance of the silence of the dog. For one true inference invariably suggests others. The Simpson incident had shown me that a dog was kept in the stables, and yet, though someone had been in and fetched out a horse, he had not barked enough to arouse the two lads in the loft. Obviously, the night midnight visitor was someone whom the dog knew well. That's just one of the cases where Holmes used this his method. The other one is uh, another kind of absence, not of noise, but of symmetry. Symmetry. This is um, in the Valley of Fear, which, in which the conversation turns to one of the objects in the room. Holmes asks what it is. Mr. Douglas's dumbbells, said Holmes. Dumbbell? There's only one. Where's the other? I don't know, Mr. Holmes. There may have been only one. I have not noticed them for months. One dumbbell, Holmes said seriously. And from that absence, silence, the absence of the other dumbbell, Holmes works out the nature of the murder and the cause of it. Now this idea of something being absent, not there, is one of the ideas that lay behind another book I wrote called The Glass Bath Escape. Because if you look at Needham's question about what didn't happen in China and extend it to what didn't happen in Islam, what was missing, what was absent in both cases, but was present in Europe. And I accidentally, with the help of my friend Jerry Martin, who was a great expert on um, scientific instruments and particularly microscopes, I accidentally, or we accidentally, stumbled on what we thought was missing, but present in Europe, which is represented by these spectacles. That is glass. Because the moment, the moment you think about it, in China, glass, as in Japan, glass was quite widespread. They knew how to make it and some was imported from the West. So by about the 10th century there was a little bit of glass, but it was only used really for decorative pretty things. You didn't need it for a hot drink like tea. You didn't need it for windows because it was too hot as much of China and earthquakes in Japan. So in both civilizations, glass, particularly flat, good quality glass, was absent. And by the 16th century, in both places, glass was more or less not made at all. No glass, a glassless civilizations to all intents and purposes. So the Japanese, for example, were astonished when the Portuguese and Dutch bought in glass in the 16th century. They asked whether it had been dug out of the ground. In Islam, which was the great, one of the great glass-making centres in, say, the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, glass was finally more or less eliminated by the Mongol invasions. The glass-makers were taken away um, to other parts of the Mongol Empire. And glass, again, didn't have a great use in practical life. It wasn't used in windows because it was too hot. Um, Islam forbade the drinking of wine, so wine glasses, which were so important in the West, were not made. Mirrors, you, mirrors were an abomination and you didn't develop glass for that. So glass died away and faded away as it had done earlier in India. So the world was divided into Western Europe where from about the 15th century or earlier, glass making developed very fast, most famously in Murano in Italy, 
but also in Germany and northern Germany and Holland and Netherlands. So glass making developed and to begin with it was for window panes and uh, later for mirrors but from about the from very early on even with the first scientific revolution uh, Roger Bacon and others noticed that glass when you put two bits of glass in the right way it could have the effect of magnifying. Human beings get something like 70% of their information through their eyes. The sight is the most powerful organ of, of human beings. Now if you can have a, an object or a material which will improve sight, whether in old age, far sight, near sight, detailed sight, then it will transform our world. That 70% of information will be greatly increased. So glass is the one substance, magical substance, which can do that, which can make far away things come close, uh, make it possible to see very small things. So from about the 15th century, glass became very important. In the shape of mirrors and glass frames, it was central, as many people like Leonardo da Vinci and others wrote, it was central to the artistic revolution, in other words, the Renaissance. Without glass and fine glass, it's difficult to see how you could have had the growth of true perspective and realist art. The um, Brunelleschi's experiments on perspective, for example, were done with, with mirrors and many of the paintings were done using mirrors. But in relation to science, the development of telescopes famously with Galileo and then the development of, the, of chemistry and the discovery of the vacuum by Robert Boyle using glass, all the sciences of the 17th and 18th century Newton's second great treatise on optics, for example, all the sciences, more or less, were dependent on the use of glass instruments. In our book um, that I mentioned, Jerry Martin and I looked at 20 great experiments that had changed our understanding of the world from the Greeks onwards, and three quarters of them could not have been done without glass. So basically, glass is not a sufficient cause. You can have glass and have no scientific revolution. But it is, I think, an absolutely necessary cause, and both in that it makes new things visible, germs, etc., etc., the minute things that were discovered with microscopes. But more deeply, it had the effect of increasing precision, glass um, making and the refining of glass was a very precise activity. It made precise vision possible as in Renaissance art and technology. But even more widely, what it did in the 16th, 17th centuries with the developments in astronomy, chemistry and so on, it's precisely at the time that Francis Bacon writes about the philosophy of science and describes a world where knowledge is growing. You have an open world, not a closed world. We are discovering new things every day using glass. And so the idea of the open scientific testing kind of world, which is behind our modern science and technology, is very much tied up with glass. And if you look at a laboratory nowadays, until very recently, and certainly 17th, 18th century, you would have found it full of glass instruments and full of people who were questioning and feeling that new laws, hidden, invisible, could be found with this magical substance. And that something which we take for granted, which is 
so obvious was behind a great deal of our modern thought. Thank you.